to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today from somewhere. I don't, I don't know where I am. You've been here. I don't know where I am. Uh, because I don't know where I am, that must mean the man, the myth, the legend is here. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Sean. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing great, thanks. And, uh... We're uh, we're actually here at my house in Cars, Ontario. It is a beautiful day. And Sean, how long did it take you to get out here? Four hours. Okay. So yeah. was, you said it was still dark when you left the house. It was. Yeah, I packed up all my things, all my provisions. And you uh, let your landlord know that you weren't going to be here. Yeah, I was very worried that I would be like the Oregon Trail and I get dysentery and die. But you didn't have to cross any water, so you're fine. No, I did. Oh, I guess, yeah, I guess I there's go, a little bit on the... On the <laughs> got across the river. Um, but yeah, so uh, so we're here. It's June. It's the start of June. It is. Which is, of course, Pride Month. It is. Uh, across Canada, North America, I'm the world. Sure. I don't know. The world. It's World Pride Month. Uh, as we get confirmation of that from the official History Slam Pride correspondent, Corey Beaton is here. Hi, Corey. Hi. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> so you are friends with Aaron in a full disclosure thing. And we don't really know each other. We've met once and you don't remember because that's how memorable I am as a human being. It was at a wedding and I was drunk. <laughs> yes. So it was at Aaron, uh, Aaron's uh, wedding to the person to whom he is currently married. Yes. Uh, for now. And uh, that's when we met. And other than that, not much interaction, but you guys are close friends. Yes. Yes. Through Megan. Thank you, thank you for that delay. That was, that was, that was, that was good. We, you, we are friends. Are, wait, wait, are we? Are we? Wait, it's what? my first podcast. I was nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Yeah, it's, yeah the, the, the visual cues tend to not go over I, well I feel on like audio. Maybe, maybe we do need a description at the, you know, uh, subtitles or something on the bottom that says, Corey is now nodding. Corey is yeah. adamantly <laughs> saying, no, he's waving his hands. Please don't. So. Yeah, like the descriptive video that yes, they have that's a for the visually video. impaired. Yes. Yeah. okay. I'm sure you can get someone to do that for yeah. you. Yeah, um, you've got the budget, right? Obviously, yeah. obviously. Um, all right, so we're here. We're, we want to talk uh, about uh, Bill C. One fifty. The fiftieth anniversary is this month here in June, and the Canadian government has decided to make a big deal of this. It's being included in Pride festivals across the country, and of course, the one dollar coin is going to have the word equality on it. That's the only thing they're doing, right? And the, on the coin. Like, it's still a loony? It's too... It looks like two gender-fluid kind of artistic something coming together. But yeah, okay. it does say equality across it. Okay, so an abstract art with equality. So we wanted to talk about this in context of the anniversary. And there's been a lot of discussion. And on, on the website as well, if, if I'll link to it if you go to the website. There was a piece earlier this year about whether or not this is actually something worth commemorating. So we wanted to talk about that in context, but let's start about Bill C-150 and what is it? So Aaron, you've gone through, you've printed out the bill. I did. Uh, so what is included in the bill and why is this a big deal for people? So there's several aspects of the of the bill. Uh, its official titer, title is an act to amend the criminal code, the parole act, the penitentiary act, the prisons and reformatories act, and to make certain consequential amendments to the Combines Investigation Act, the Customs Tariff, and the National Defense Act. Quite a mouthful. It's a lot of things. And you have like two pages there. There's a lot. Yeah, I didn't print out all of it. Oh, okay. Um, largely because I don't think we're going to be focusing on the, let's just, Prisons and Reformatories Act. Right. I mean, I, I'm sure that's coming up in a future episode, but for, <laughs> for now, we're, we're not touching on that this one. This is a part of our continuing coverage of Bill C-150. <laughs> Wonderful. So yes, yeah, so, so very complex bill. If anyone's ever read uh, an act of parliament, it's... The language, of course, is very legal. I know that sounds stupid to say, but the language is not entirely clear at all times. Um, but some of the provisions of the act is that it addressed uh, abortion, it addressed um, same-sex uh, relations, it addressed uh, drunk driving of all things, and gambling. So hmm. few, like that's why it was called an omnibus bill. Like many different things within this act. So it's not one or another, but it does touch on a whole bunch of little things. Yeah, with drunk driving, you said this is where we get the point oh eight yeah. from abortion. It's therapeutic abortions are allowed. Yeah, it allowed for there's a panel of three doctors and if the mental, physical or emotional well being of the mother was threatened by a pregnancy, this panel of three doctors could determine whether or not the, an abortion could be 
performed. Right. So, so they decide if she's going to die. And if she is, she can have an abortion. That's my understanding, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so broad-based there. We're not going to talk about any of this in any detail, but just to say that the act is bigger than just the part that's being commemorated on the loony. Yes. In fact, if anyone actually goes and prints out, maybe we'll try to link it. Uh, yeah, we can link to this. We can link yeah. to this. It's, it, let's see here. It's one, two, three. For all intents and purposes, three paragraphs when, when addressing private acts between consenting adults. So the wording of this is important. So let's just do the wording real quick. So yeah. it's two it's two consenting adults over the age of 21 in private. So here, so we're talking about uh, same-sex intercourse is essentially what we're talking about here. Um, the old the old term is what they used to call it, buggery, which had then been changed in the criminal to- code to anal intercourse, which was then removed from the criminal code. I be- No, no, it's still there in the criminal code. Yes, it is. Anal intercourse is actually still on the books. Okay. And, it's and being illegal. Code. It's being illegal. But I'll read just very quickly the act because it won't take very long, even if you can, uh, if you can link to this. So, section seven. The said act is further amended by adding thereto, immediately after section 149 thereof, the following section. Quote, sections 147 and 149 do not apply to any act committed in private between A, a husband and his wife, or B, any two persons, each of whom is 21 years or more of age, both of whom consent to the commission of the act. Very vague. So this amendment really doesn't do anything uh, in that sense, because as, as was pointed out in a bunch of different places, two consenting adults in private, neither of them are going to go to the police. Yeah, it's unenforceable. So it's an unenforceable thing that they're doing here. So, uh, but let's talk about how, why this happened when it happened. So, so Corey, you remember the guy's name, uh, Everett Clippard? Uh, so yeah, his name was Everett George Clippard, and his case basically went all the way to the Supreme Court because he was one of the last people arrested for homosexual acts. He he was a, a Calgary man, uh, a Calgary man who was a homosexual. He was a popular bus driver there, and. Uh, one of the men that he was having a relationship with, his dad found out about it and actually went to the police about it. Um, the police entered his apartment and found his little black dating book. And they basically charged him with 18 counts of gross indecency. And he went to prison for four years. He served that time. And then when he left prison, he made a new start in the Northwest Territories. Someone's house was burned down and the police were questioning anybody that might have been involved in it. And the police basically said either admit to further homosexual acts or we're going to charge you with arson so he admitted to having sex with four other individuals in northwest territory so he went back to jail his sister was a legal clerk and she actually kept fighting and kept fighting and kept fighting and it went all the way to the supreme court um it was still rejected in the supreme court um but this was the case that uh was mentioned in the house of commons tommy douglas brought it up as a way of introducing the idea that maybe this isn't a criminal act. Right, because again, it's in private. Now the, the thing though with him, that this act or the amendment in some of his cases wouldn't have done anything no. because he was using his car. Yeah, for so some he, of... he actually, like after the act was passed, he actually stayed in prison until 1971 because the crimes that he was charged with actually took place in his car. So it didn't qualify as a private residence behind a closed door. I'm going to jump in very quickly because the act does specifically define what private means. And it says, an act shall be deemed not to have been committed in private if it is committed in a public place or if more than two persons take part or are present. And a person shall be deemed not to consent. To, oh, okay. Well, right. Obvious. Yeah. Obvi- yeah. If someone doesn't consent, then, then yeah, that's obviously. Different. But yeah. So, yeah. I mean, very. That's called rape. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Again, once again, very vague wording for it being not committed in private. So any public place. Basically, it sounds like as long as it doesn't or if it doesn't happen in a bedroom, it's technically a public place. Yeah. Or I guess a house. Or a private like residence. Like a private residence. Like it's yeah. Just, it's very. It's very strange. And the two people like. Who cares? Like, who cares how many people you get down with? And that's and that was the thing. In fact, Do your thing. if you read the read the House of Commons Hansard, it gets really ridiculous. Some of the arguments that are brought up there. It's like, oh, but if a third person comes in, and what happens in? In fact, some members of the House of Commons brought up bestiality 
trying to right. find a way to poke holes in this in this amendment. So it just it kind of got a little silly trying to find ways to define adding in a third person. So anyway. yeah, which still happens, of course. Uh, there's a great song by Garfunkel and Oates after one of these televangelists talked about it was anti-gay marriage and was like, well, then you're going to marry ducks. So they wrote a whole song about wanting to marry a duck. I haven't heard um, that one. Yeah, it's great. And by marry, I mean not marry. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so the, the parliamentarians, while this is going on, are going out of their way to say that we're not legalizing homosexuality. Very much right? so. So there's the great, great, air quotes, great quote by John Turner uh, that you've written down where he is the justice minister at this point. This is basically his bill. And he is stepping all over himself yes. to say that we're not legalizing homosexuality. No. So during the debates in the House of Commons, um, members from the opposition parties were basically saying to Justice Minister John Turner that, while well, you're legalizing homosexuality. This is terrible. I don't want to ever see this in Canada. And while at the same time, Turner is trying to move something forward, like you said, he's kind of walking all over himself. And he says, and I quote, the conduct contemplated in this clause, homosexual acts between consenting adults in private, is repugnant to most of us. It is repugnant to the great majority of the people of Canada. I resent very much the argument of some members of the opposition that this legalizes homosexuality. You very can't, you can't, Yeah, you can't be clearer than that. No. So even though, so this is why I think um, understandable that this commemoration is problematic. Because right. yes, it, we have a step forward in 1969 in the sense that the government is recognizing that you have an unenforceable law, but it's being very clear and unequivocally clear that homosexuality is still considered illegal in Canada right. as late as 1969. Right. And so the significance of that, uh, which we'll talk about, is is probably symbolic uh, that, that they're still talking about how illegal it is and the word repugnant, right? That's obviously a carefully chosen word. Oh, yes. Uh, and the fact that it's still illegal is seen. The number I, I found was 1,300 people between... Um, 1968 or a, sorry after this is passed until sort of early 80s 1300 men are charged in bathhouse raids and, and things like that uh, across the country a lot in toronto certainly uh so the idea that this decriminalizes homosexuality of course isn't real because people were charged criminally with being homosexual so yes uh, so it doesn't really hold muster but it, it is it's the famous moment in canadian history because of the pierre trudeau quote where he says that the state has no place in people's bedrooms, which is, of course, uh, accurate, but at the same time, they're not actually doing what we now celebrate in a way that they're doing. So, let, so let's talk about that part of it, as now that we've sort of established the factual framework for it. So the loony, we can talk about the loony, but let, let's, let's talk about what's going on more in a broader sense. So the theme of Capital Pride this year is the Toronto Pride. Or Toronto Pride is related to this? It's commemorating the 50th anniversary of the partial legalization of homosexuality. Okay, so is there, for you, is there any subtlety in that? Is there any acknowledgement of that this is sort of a mixed bag? Or is it purely a case of, be, let's be, be celebratory? I think it's complicated because... Obviously, this only partially legalized homosexuality. Um, it was a really minor step. It's worth commemorating. However, it's almost too nuanced and complicated of a situation to almost dumb down to a theme of something or to put on a coin. or So it's almost like you need an asterisk with, like, we're celebrating 50 years, asterisk, not really. Like, <laughs> it yeah. was actually you know, decades and decades and decades of other people fighting for anti-discrimination laws and, and and progress like that. So it's it's certainly worthy of acknowledging, but it it requires a bigger discussion. Right, because like what would the parade float be? Two guys in a bedroom? <laughs> like 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 there's really there's no real symbol for it because of how limited this is. Yeah. Right. Like, I, I, the, the bigger significance is probably the Pierre Trudeau quote. That has more legs than the actual act. I think the Pierre well, Trudeau if, if quote anything, because is, it's it's you know memorable. Yeah. Like the the act itself is is not. It's meaningless. Itself, yeah, it's not really memorable. Well, it's, if you're gonna make homosexuality legal, you're gonna have to actually say homosexuality, which it doesn't. Yes. 
Whereas, at least with Pierre Trudeau, he did actually say with regards to homosexuality. Right. So, yeah, so a greater acknowledgement of what is actually being discussed, right? Whereas, yeah, John Turner doesn't, right, in his quote. He Refer just, to. The, the, he doesn't say the word homosexual, does he? Does he just he? says repugnant about four times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does. So it's like this double speak of like, it's like Liberace. We're, we're not going to actually say what's happening, right? Like, yeah. It's sort of there, but it's this present other. And everybody knows what's going on, but we can't actually say it. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, it's, it, it really is one of those, it's, it's so tough because I was absolutely, before I started researching this, of the mindset that I remember thinking to myself, yeah, ni- homosexuality was illegal until 1969. It's like, finally, Canada did something in the 60s to move this along. And then the more I read into it, it's like, they didn't really do much of anything. It's just, mm. it keeps coming back to, they removed an unenforceable law from the criminal code now obviously removing it from or adding an amendment to the criminal code is great in and of itself because if we like to assume that our country is governed by laws and that we adhere to these laws then yes laws are important words are important but the essence of it is so hollow Mm -hmm. and i think that was the the i don't know if i want to say disappointment but it, it really struck me that it it really wasn't as big a moment as i i as right. I had thought it was. And now, of course, with the commemoration, it's a little difficult because then this, you know, it needs to be more nuanced, I think. But I guess the question I would have then is, even though the actual act doesn't do anything, you know, I'm reminded of the line from The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance where the, at the end where the newspaper man says, when, when the myth becomes fact, or when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. So even though this doesn't actually do anything in the moment, the fact that over time it gets held up as a, pivotal moment and is used in a way to support the the gay rights movement over time i don't does that matter like the sort of the growth and sort of the imagination around this moment maybe that's worth celebrating more than what it actually did like i, I like i don't know like, like at what point because cause you got to think it's it's 1969 and homosexuality is like it's not mainstream, obviously, in sort of mainstream culture, mm-hmm. in, in terms of the acknowledgement of it. So maybe this little baby step is the first moment that gets a ball rolling, that eventually leads us to 2005 and the legalization of gay marriage. Like I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's sort of that my mi- that minor step where sort of the toe crosses the line, and that starts the downhill roll. Not to say that there's not obstacles in the movement through the rest of the 20th century and, and even today, mm-hmm. but I, I, I don't know. Is, the, like, is this first public acknowledgement of it the start? I don't, and is that worth commemorating? It is significant, only because I think it was a little step. It brought it into the public discourse a little bit, but, and actually the, uh, the, the greater progress was actually uh, attained by protest to this and how it didn't do enough. Mm-hmm. And how it targeted sex workers or it targeted people of color or further marginalized people because it didn't do anything to protect those people because they couldn't perform these acts in a private home. So, yeah, so that gives them this because before there's really nothing. Well, there's obviously stuff to protest, but this opens the door. The government with this act has opened the door and the Pierre Trudeau quote of saying, there's no place for, uh, for the state in these places, then protest and the movement can hold the government account to the government's own words, as opposed to any sort of outside ideas of morality or ethics or anything else. You're saying, you said this, now mm-hmm. do this. And, and that's at least my understanding of what a lot of the subsequent, like in the 70s, the movement was doing. The government opens the door a crack, and then the movement, over time, busts the door down. Yeah, I think that's fair um, to an extent. I think it goes, it, it also leads to the fact that putting anything into the public discourse in and of itself is probably a good thing because it get, it makes people have to confront it. Whether or not, you know, it could be like what a lot of these parliamentarians were saying that they think it's morally repugnant or others just saying, simply, I don't care. I mean, you know, what two consenting adults do is none of my business. That That's great. So um, I think getting into the public discourse, I mean, that's how you get, 
that's how you get things moving, right? It's not just one protest is not going to change legislation, obviously. It gets people thinking. It gets people talking about these things. And so if you have if you have something like this, even open it up a crack. And if it did indeed allow the protests and the counter movements to gain traction, that's great because then it forces the people, the Canadian right. public, to actually have to confront it. Right. And only once the you know, the public of Canada start talking about it, is you're going to see any change whatsoever. Uh, I suppose that's true. However, police rates did actually increase after 1969. Um, and the Canadian government actually had several practices of purging civil servants and people from the military. And that was all through the 70s, 80s, that's and 90s. That's true. Yeah. So that did continue. Oh, yeah. And so, it wasn't until recently that um, it's an, an apology, essentially, for the for kicking out of same sex or sorry uh, homosexuals in the military and I don't know if it was did did they get the public service as well? Yes. If, yes. If they did yes. apologize. Yeah, was... no, they did apologize for the public service. Yes. Okay. They did. That one I couldn't remember, but I know it was definitely the military. And there was a an apology for that. With yeah, and with compensation, I believe. Yes. Uh, for people who were who were purged, but again, I wonder. So the Overton window. So the Overton window is that. If you have a, you have the idea of a policy that seems extreme, right? This is what Donald Trump does, and also Barack Obama did. So, like, all politicians do this. So, like, the way Barack Obama did it was like universal health care. Like, that's the extreme policy or seemingly extreme policy who want. Like, so he talks about that, but then you dial it back in and you do it in stages. So you're like, okay, first instead of this, we'll start with this. And then this next one doesn't seem as extreme. And then this next one doesn't seem as extreme. And to a certain extent, the, the gay rights movement over time did this as well. Well, if the ultimate, like the marriage push, for instance, well, we don't start with marriage. We start with civil unions and we start with the rights there. Mm. And so the, the what was an extreme idea doesn't seem as extreme over time. You take sort of the baby step approach. And, and I do wonder if this is a part of a process like that, that fits into that window and Stuart Chambers wrote a really interesting article that I read yesterday about this where he talked about what this does is it separates legality from morality, this, the, the act in, in 69, where the politicians can, as John Turner, can still be morally opposed to what's going on, mm -hmm. but recognize that it, morality and legality are different things. So even though you might oppose something morally, that doesn't necessarily mean it should be legally prohibited. Mm -hmm. And so that distinction is, is, is I think, kind of interesting. And, and for as much as the subsequent raids and, and the purging and all that is negative, I, I, I still just wonder if this is a moment in time that just, again, opens the door and just allows an open and frank discussion that what happens subsequently is wrong. And that legally the government has no right to do this because it's been established that they have no right to do this. And would would the raids and the arrest and the purging have happened anyway? I would I would argue they probably would have because they happened elsewhere. Right? If you look at the, And they were happening before. And they're happening before. Yeah. Too. So so even though stuff increases afterwards. I mean, it's counterfactual history, but to say that would they have not increased afterwards anyway, just because of the the trends where social where, where society was? I don't know. Well, there's a point that uh, that was brought up. I kind of want to go back to, and I think Cor can speak to this. Um, you mentioned how the purges from the, the civil service and the military, and we were chatting about this a little bit the other day. It was something called the fruit machine, and you you want to you know mention that? Can you kind of give a debrief for anyone who wasn't familiar with that? So the fruit machine was a basically a purging tool that the Canadian government used on civil servants and personnel in the military who were suspected of being homosexual. There was an entire department in the RCMP that was devoted to basically following people around and identifying them as homosexual and building a case against them. And the actual fruit machine was a small room that they had in office buildings where they would hook you up to a bunch of machines and show you pornographic images of men and take pictures of your pupils. And if you dilated a certain way, they would identify you as a homosexual. And then they would basically say, we will either out you and then fire you or you can resign. 
And I think the Canadian government had 9,000 files of, of employees that they were actually investigating. That's a lot. Some would say too many. <laughs> 9,000 too many. 9,000 too many. Also, who, who on staff had to go get the porn? Like, whose job was that? I would also like to think that if <laughs> your boss dragged you into a room and showed you pornographic images at work, your eyes would probably dilate a little bit, regardless of your sexuality. So it was yeah. kind of a problematic yeah. tool I don't, I don't, for yeah, determining... I think anyone would be a little uncomfortable with your boss saying, like, I'm just going to show you some images here. You, you tell me how you feel. And I would feel inc- insanely uncomfortable, and um, my pupils would probably dilate. Yeah. I'm just going to go on record and yeah. say that right now. So yeah, of course. And today you would just go to HR and then your boss would be fired. But at the time you would go to HR and then you would be fired. So. Yeah. So just give a little bit more context just for anyone who's interested. The Fruit Machine was a device developed by Frank Robert Wake. And yeah, this this idea that it could identify gay men. And of course, I mean, the Fruit Machine was based on the derogatory term referring to gay men as fruits. So yes, if, if you if that was your initial reaction to think, oh, I wonder if this is derogatory. Oh yes, very much. Let's get back to sort of the commemorative part of this. So Corey, you've been to Pride things before. Yes. How much space is there at a Pride events for any sort of nuance? Because uh, as you said, this is a nuanced thing. This is not a cut and dry. It's clear what the purpose or what the meaning of this anniversary is. So within Pride activities, how much space is there for any sort of nuanced discussion of things? Not a lot of space. Um, a lot of Pride events, I mean, there's this big sort of push and pull with, with, is this a political protest? Is this a celebration? What is it? Is it just a whole bunch of people in scantily clad things dancing around and having a really good time? Or is it acknowledging that it took a lot of people fighting and a lot of people dying and a lot of people being thrown in jail and fired and and stuff to get to the point where we can celebrate openly. So there's that sort of dichotomy within Pride uh, celebrations. My problem with sort of commemorating it is, is that there isn't enough room for the nuance and I don't want anybody who maybe doesn't necessarily understand sort of like the more complicated parts of this to go like, oh, cool, Canada legalized homosexuality in 1969. Like, great job. I mean, if you look any deeper into it, you realize they sort of just slightly changed the criminal code to take out butt stuff, basically, <laughs> which in historically speaking, France did basically the same thing in 1791. If they're doing this in Toronto, how, and you might know, specifically but in general like how would you expect it to be commemorated within the events like could it be a float in the parade or a section of the parade or is there enough activity around pride where you could have some sort of a panel and would people go in for an hour and just talk i would imagine that that's probably where you're going to see most of this you're going to have speakers and you're going to have that kind of stuff i think the parade will be the parade the parade right because the parade, yeah, the parade is the space to just be... The parade is fun. Right? The parade the is, point. yeah, it's to have a ridiculous amount of fun. Right. It's not to sit back and have a detailed discussion no, about but, the legal But to, but legal to also policy. remember that the first Pride Parade was a riot. So that, actually, let's talk about that too. Because this relates to Stonewall. in Also 1969 in New York, the Stonewall Tavern, which I went to uh, when I was in New York... It is a hole in the wall. Like, and it was a, a hole then. Yeah, too. like as a physical... <laughs> like, like I was very under... Like, for some reason, I, th- I expected to go in and it'd be like this large place, um, rather ornate. I, and I don't know why I expected that. But no, it was like a hole in the wall tavern where I bought a crappy beer for like $9. So that was fun. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm glad I went. But so Stonewall happens in the same year. And Stonewall... I don't know, like Stonewall is held up in the United States as the start of the gay rights movement, or at least the modern gay rights movement. And is it possible that Canada is trying to search for a parallel here and just wants to get in on the the whole idea of being progressive and, and that the anniversary of Stonewall is actually a motivating factor for some of these commemorations of the bill? I think that's a fair assessment. I think this is Canada's acknowledgement of an anniversary of something that is equivalent to Stonewall when they're quite different. Right. 
But because the same thing though with Stonewall, like, it's a it's a raid. There's a riot, and then subsequently people continue to get arrested in the United States. Mm-hmm. So so it's a, sort of the same thing. Like Stonewall is held up as this major moment, but at the same time, nothing immediately changes after it. No. And I, I and I, I I think it's more of like a re- retrospective thing, like like this this was the night looking back right. where where everything changed, and I think this is almost Canada trying to treat this as the day that everything changed. When I would argue that that's kind of a problematic way of looking at it. Right, and of course the difference with Stonewall is they're being raided and they say no. We're not doing this. This is a leg- This is a, a minor part of a larger legislative bill. It <laughs> like sounds very Canadian. I yeah, don't know. <laughs> like it's, it is. It is a very different. It is a very different thing. It, it struck me, especially in that regard, um, because Canada, of course, was basically following what they did in the UK, because the UK did something similar uh, in 1960, and it was based on the Wolfenden Report, which basically just said that you know this is an unenforceable law. Why do we still have it on the books here in the UK? So the Parliament in 1960 just eliminated it. And then, of course, like, I think it's very striking that the Americans, just like everything, is based on a very wow moment, whereas Canada is very methodical, very, right. s- very dry, if you will. Yes. We're not going to be confrontational about this. No. The, the, so there's another part of this, too, that, that I was reading about, and it's the psychological profession's role uh, and psychiatrists that th- they had a role in this, too, that while they were still considering homosexuality as a mental defect or whatever the actual term within the profession was, that it's sort of the pathological thing, that they were instrumental in trying to push the government away from criminality. So for as terrible as the idea of sexual orientation being a mental whatever... Perversion. A, a perversion, thank you. For, for as terrible as that is... It was actually useful in a sense of getting away from the idea of it being a criminal act. So I, I just wonder what we think about that dynamic here. That's all sorts of problem. And just for the record, <laughs> I, that, that's, that's an article. David Kimmel and Daniel Robinson. And I don't think they were saying that's a good thing. They were just arguing that the push towards a pathological explanation influenced the discussion on criminality. Well, it, that's definitely pops up in the parliamentary debates you see that actually quite a bit that it mentions that homosexuality is a perversion it's a it's akin to a mental illness there there's one quote i can't remember the name of the uh, of the mp but i have a quote here that uh, that was said in the house of commons and, is, and it says and i quote accordingly the homosexual we are told must not be blamed for his perversion his is merely the, he is merely the victim of fate and consequently not responsible for his antisocial behavior of course, whether they be alcoholics, gamblers, or homosexuals, they all refuse any responsibility for their perversion, yet they give in freely to their appetites, proving that they have no desire to be rid of their passions, end quote. So you've got this pseudo, once again, pseudoscientific idea that, you know, homosexuality is, is akin to having alcohol addiction or a gambling problem. So, I mean, you wonder how much of that is psychiatrists actually believing what they say that it is a mental illness or is it just more garbage that was thrown around i don't know and that's why i think it's problematic because this is you know it's based on faulty science right and i mean obviously the negatives that come out of that are things like the conversion therapy and and all that whole can of like there's there's no question that that perspective is bad although that mp i'm sure got that guy was on our side yeah (laughs) weird yeah (laughs) yeah right and that guy he probably got reelected in a landslide too more than Um, but that's again that's why i think this this question of nuance comes in and you know this is not a linear story it's not a case of for as much as i said earlier like this is a start maybe it it gets on a downhill it was more of a roller coaster where there's uphill like you know like there's in a in a case like this frankly it's like anything you can't just say this happened and the world changed and everything was better now and I think that's the problem I have with the commemorative part of this, is that it's not being presented as the start of something, it's being presented as the end of something. I think it's just an oversimplification mm-hmm. uh, of something that's a lot more complicated. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just worried that some people will think that this, this makes us a progressive country when there were decades after that where there was a lot of progress that was made, but it was for continued 
fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And right. to today, too, like it's to, not yeah. over, right? No. And it's not over. No, right. right. No, there's still I mean, the numbers are good. The article I read this morning was like we're up to 80 percent of people who are cool with homosexuality. Which like okay, but what, what's wrong with the, what, what's up with the other twenty percent? Yeah, it's like, like like what really needs to happen? Corey, so <laughs> as you said, oversimplification, but worthwhile of noting. Certainly worthwhile of noting if it generates more conversation about it. Okay, so how would you suggest, as being someone who has been to these events, that within the setting within a celebratory setting, right? Because there's no question that at least the public face of Pride events, is celebratory. How then do you acknowledge this properly within the, with recognizing the nuance, but doing so within a celebratory environment? It seems extraordinarily difficult to me to find a way to do that. Which I think is the problem, because I, I, don't, I don't know how you do it. I, I, I really don't. I, I, I think you, you talk about it, and, and I, yeah, I, I don't have an answer. Right. For, for how for how for how you do it, I understand like the importance of commemorating it. I just don't know how you do it necessarily properly to give it justice and to to make people understand that it's still a work in progress. So really, obviously, like, Pride is a great forum in the sense to maybe lay that that seed to, to germinate to have people think about it and then have I don't know if it's another event. I don't know if it's you know doing like a year long engagement i don't know but you know to try to get that idea rolling so that it's not just that pride that we talk about straight people are not going to put up with 12 months of pride they can barely put up with june (laughs) (laughs) well then maybe that's what then we need to and that's what i mean like trying to think of a way to get the conversation rolling so that obviously pride is a great place for it to start at because you know it's it's a logical place in which you you know you have the conversation begin but not take away from what the essence of pride is and like you said it's, it's a celebration it, it's about being comfortable just doing everything that you're supposed to do because that's what everyone else does i mean you know you get to live your life the way you want it to as it should be but then have have a way that you can get the the, the public talking about it that is deeper that's more nuanced that's not just taking a, a loony out of your pocket and saying oh all right well here you know you look at the image and say all right, I thought about it. Now give me my dollar or no, give me my whatever you would like to exchange your dollar for goods or service. Who uses cash? You. I don't use cash. I never use cash. It's 2019. Okay. Get it together. I thought it was you that used cash. No, Damien Claude Belanger. That's the one who I'm thinking Uses about. cash exclusively. I yes. only use pride loonies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. So let's talk about this loony real quick. So it's an abstract piece of two figures coming together. We'll put, I'll put, if you've, you haven't seen it, because as we talk about this, I haven't seen it. Uh, I'll put an image on the post uh, when we when we have the episode live. So if you haven't seen it, go see it or just Google it. But if it's sort of this abstract image, two people coming together with word equality, the, I, I, don't, I don't really understand. Okay, now Corey is showing it to me. So it's two figures that are kind of kissing, but also cheating to the camera which is strange. And then behind them, I don't know what it's supposed to be behind them. I'm very confused by this. Uh, So does the inclusion of this on a loony help or hurt the commemorative cause? So let's say you're in, and with all all due respect to my Alberta friends, let's say you're in Alberta, uh, rural Alberta, deep blue, socially conservative Alberta. And... You know, Aunt Sally, uh, who is uh, anti-gay marriage, goes down to the Canadian Tire and gets one of these coins as change. And she looks at it. Do you think that with somebody like that, a representation of the act and sort of the larger symbolic meaning of the act is beneficial to the cause of gay rights in Canada, given the 20% of the population that still has, at least in polling, still has a problem with it. Like, do you think this, someone would look at this and say, okay, yeah, I'm not anti-gay anymore. Okay, I'll take it in a different direction. Things like this are not for straight people to be comfortable with gay people. They are a symbol for gay people to see 
who may be stuck in the closet and are looking for something that might say, hey, I belong. So in that sense, that's where the coin I think is a good idea. It's not gonna convert Aunt Sally into being like a gay loving, like NDP or which would be great. And my apologies to all the Aunt Sally's out there. <laughs> if you have an Aunt Sally who's very progressive and cool, then I apologize to her personally. I'm so sorry, <laughs> Sally. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I, okay, and I, I get that. Like, that it's important for youth to see themselves reflected in the national symbols of the country. Like, I, I get that perspective. But again, as you've said before, sort of the oversimplification of that, that if this youth then goes and Googles this, uh, they, they're... Are, are they going to learn the whole history behind right, it? Right, behind it, yeah. Maybe not. They're going to be like, what's a loony? Yeah, in all likelihood. <laughs> That's my yes. first question, yes. In all likelihood, yes. So, uh, so what, I don't know, Aaron, what do you think of the design? And... I was just looking at it there. I'm probably not the best one to speak to that. I, I just, I don't get the designs on most of our coins when uh, when we're commemorating things. Since this isn't obviously the first commemorative uh, coin that's come out, I know that there's been quite a few for different events. And some of them I've looked at and I thought are fantastic. Others, I've they've kind of confused me. I think part of it as well, I'll admit that... Uh, I'm probably like most people, I don't look at my change very often when I do use it. It's, I kind of go through it and say, oh good, I do have a loony here. And I don't think to look on it. But I think being aware of it is something. Again, I think it's better than nothing. Again, it's oversimplified. It, it's not nuanced enough, but it's something. And I, I, I didn't think about it the way that Cor was saying it. I think it's perfect that it's for gay people to look at that and just say, I do belong. And that, you know, my government recognizes that I'm here and that, I, you know, it's not about a dichotomy between straight and gay. It just means that I'm here, I'm a Canadian and this is, you know, I'm part of my country. Yeah. And I guess that, sorry, Corey. Uh, I would just say like a lot of like the visibility stuff, I did air quotes, sorry, is, is often framed for straight people to be more comfortable with certain things and I would like to take it more as it's more for the people that need to see something that is not mainstream that that they can identify with because I mean I'm only 37 I can't believe I said that but <laughs> don't worry like, we'll over that <laughs> okay. 26 for the, for the, I am 26 <laughs> But anyways, but like, so like in mass media, I never saw things that I could identify with to make me feel comfortable. So the more of those things that are put out there, they're not to make straight people feel more comfortable. They're, the benefit is to the people that are looking for something that makes them feel like they belong. So then it'd be like an added bonus if say someone who didn't really think about it before picked up the coin and say, huh, that's interesting. Like it's just an added bonus is what you can kind of see it that way. Sure. I think the bigger intent is to make marginalized people feel seen that as opposed to. Well, so in that sense, then isn't it a good idea to take every opportunity possible and every anniversary, even as conflicted as this anniversary might be to do that? I think, again, I think it's a start. If nothing else, it's a start. And I mean, it gets the conversation roll. I mean, we're having a conversation about this now. Yeah. Right. On, on this, on this show, we're having a conversation about it because of a decision to hold a commemorative celebration. Right. And I'm not going to lie, cause I'm not a historian. So I what? heard it. I, 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 I know I'm what? Cut off. 40 something minutes into this and you're just <laughs> telling me that. Yeah. What? Um, whoever the producer of this oh episode my goodness. kind of failed. So sad. Anyway. So what, <laughs> what, what I am saying is I, I heard about it at, at, uh, Ottawa's winter pride. Like, this is when they were going to, first, like, that's when I first heard about homosexuality becoming legalized in 1969. And then I, because I am interested in stuff like that, looked into it and go like, oh, that's actually kind of complicated. That's weird. You know? <laughs> and it's like, but also Winter Pride was very careful to say, like, we are celebrating the partial legalization of homosexuality, which is weird to celebrate something partial. Right, but you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. No, right? that's you, true. You know, it's, that's it's, very you know true. it takes time. Uh, any sort of movement, right? Women's rights, the women's rights movement is similar. Like, there's, you know, you have the person's case, but like things didn't end with the person's case, right? Yeah. It's sort of the, the same thing. It's sort of a, a long, drawn out process. And you also can't judge things that happened in the past with the standards of today. I think that's called presentism. It is. 
I thought you said you weren't a historian. I learned something Come yesterday. Come on, man. Jeez. He's, are you sure he's not a historian? He told me he wasn't. Just drop presentism on him. So what do we think then the messaging or the message should be? What, what do we want people to take out of the anniversary? Because, you know, the, the post on active history that we had a couple months ago where people were sort of crapping all over it. I read it and I thought this is why we can't have nice things. But then at the same time, I understand the perspective of don't just celebrate and don't just say this is it. Like, I understand that there needs to be the nuance and, and that. So what do we want to come out of this entire discussion? Uh, to me, I think it's that we want people to be aware of how marginalized individuals have struggled and, and that groups have had to push for their rights and that, that advocacy takes time and that there isn't one single act that ever sort of eliminates any sort of bias or prejudice against people that it takes time. So that that's to me, that's what I would want people to take out of it. And that, again, this is sort of the start or could be considered a starting point along the way. But I, I don't know. I, I, for me, I think it would be, this is a good, I probably said this too many times, but a good starting point. If you're interested in learning about the evolution of same-sex rights or same-sex couples rights i think this is a good starting point this is something that it's something tangible mm -hmm. it's not just um someone got arrested or someone got murdered it's it's the government taking a step however small or however complicated it is a, it is one step along the path and i think that's the it, it gets the conversation rolling it gets it gets people thinking about it. And I think the biggest thing about it as well is that whenever there's any of these commemorations or if there's a celebration, those that want to celebrate it or are and are interested are going to be for it. They're going to get involved. They're going to learn. Those that are adamantly opposed are going to ignore it or oppose it with all their might. And so it's not really for them anyway. They're going to go to straight pride. Yeah. Right. They're, they're, yeah. they're going to fly to Boston. Because that's the thing this year. They're going to fly to Boston and participate in straight pride because, and again, so this is not for them. And I don't think there's, that's fine. That's not for you. Ignore it or whatever. I mean, we would hope that it opens people's minds, but some people are just going to hate on it no matter what. Aaron, will you go to straight pride with me? You can, I'll, I'll be your ally. Please. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, finally, there's something for straight people. I mean... I need this break. <laughs> but again, only if you come as my ally. I will be there to support you. <laughs> Thank you for supporting my lifestyle. <laughs> Yours is a choice. <laughs> it really is. Look where we are. Jeez, like <laughs> living here is not natural. Um, so uh, I, I will just say real quick too that we should mention in, on the show that this did not cover uh, lesbian relationships any of this that this was purely a male thing well especially lesbians because aren't covered. the the act itself yeah had nothing to do with lesbian couples and i think that's that's the other very important part about it because exactly if it had have used the word homosexuals or homosexuality there would have been more to it but it's it skirts the issue almost yeah. and so women yet again were essentially ignored i mean yeah. it, like it, maybe again. it had to do with the, uh, most of the MPs, maybe all of them. I don't know. I'm not a historian being male. I can probably say with a large degree of certainty that if not all 99% of the MPs at this parliament were men. Yeah. So and, there you go. Yeah. So I, I think it's probably safe. But yeah, that, that is very important to point out as well. It's like women yet again, unfortunately, were ignored. I mean, it's, it's another step along the way, but... Uh, I mean, abortion in there, but it wasn't even women's rights abortion. It was just, it's... It was let three male doctors decide about your abortion. Yeah. So, I mean, and I think if nothing else, uh, topic for another conversation, but I mean, with all the issues that are going on in the U.S. about abortion, and obviously here in Canada, excuse me, there's a lot of people saying, oh, this can never happen in Canada. And I've read many articles, articles to say it could. Don't get complacent. This what's happening in Alabama or Georgia or Texas could happen here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's not get complacent. So, I mean, let's, you know, use Bill C-150 for all its faults or for, for laudable whatever. Something's in there. I mean, again, it got the ball rolling. 
Can I just say that some things like that are happening in Canada? And I think we should mention that for sure. I mean, it does matter who you vote for. Like, look what happened in Alberta. Look what happened with GSAs. Uh, they're rewriting the Education Act, and they're not uh, uh, including the, uh, the right to privacy uh, of students who join GSAs. Uh, you look at the sex ed curriculum repeal in Ontario. That is a big deal. I did not have comprehensive sex ed when I was in school, and I needed it. And to erase that erases that, those people who are looking for answers from the public sphere, and it is dangerous. So this stuff is happening in Canada. And that's why things like Pride are really important too, right? Like that these events continue to happen uh, and, and ha open up discussions uh, about these issues. So let's end on a little more of a positive note. So with Pride Month, how, do, how, how are we going to celebrate? You don't have to be gay to go to a Pride event or a Pride parade either. Like if no, you, and if, bring your kids. Like, yeah, if, if you just like parades, go and, go and enjoy a parade. I mean... That's, that's what they're there for. They're for enjoyment. It's all about fun. With that, uh, everybody enjoy Pride Month. We're, we're dropping this. If you're listening to it when it drops, the anniversary is today or tomorrow. I can't remember uh, what day we're dropping it. It is the 27th. I, I can't remember what day I'm on the schedule for. Uh, but certainly uh, take note of the anniversary. And you'll as we release it, you'll still have a couple days left of Pride Month. Uh, and hopefully there's some Pride activities where you are. If not, you can participate in on online and stuff. Uh, hashtags and all that stuff. There's sort of a whole online community. I believe um, the woman to whom I'm married to, or related to you by marriage, wanted you to mention gay Twitter. Yeah, follow gay Twitter. It's better than straight Twitter. <laughs> Definitely. What is, what is gay Twitter? It's just where I get all my news. Okay. Any particular people who we should follow? Uh, Louis Vertel. He has a really good podcast. Uh, he's part of the Pod Save America people. Follow him. He's hilarious on Twitter. Actually, Pete Buttigieg and his husband, Chastin, Pete Buttigieg is running for president in the States. Chastin is awesome on Twitter. Absolutely. <laughs> his meme game is very, 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 very strong. Okay. So there you go. So follow all that uh, on Twitter. Uh, and thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Uh, very much enjoyed it. Uh, Corey, where can people find you on Twitter? Oh, if, if you want to hear me yell at politicians, um, it's at hcores, and that's H C and then five O's R E S <laughs> and there's a pride flag at the end of my name. <laughs> so that's how you know you find them. So uh, so <laughs> go follow Corey. Yell at politicians. Uh, Aaron Man Myth Legend appearance number. Have, have we just stopped keeping track? Probably. I yeah. Mean, I can't believe I'm, I keep being welcome back. <laughs> well, this and one you brought up friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're expanding the podcast universe. Uh, I enjoy that. I'm trying. Yeah. So you can follow Aaron at Aaron Boys one uh, Very, very lame compared to Corey's ha to handle, so my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> you will not be finding me yelling at politicians. Uh, in fact, mine is very, very lame. I don't, I barely, I don't think I've tweeted in a couple of years now. All right. Way to advertise yourself, yeah, buddy. Good, good, good job. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thank you, guys. If anybody has any questions or comments for the show, you can find us. Uh, history slam at gmail.com you can find me on twitter at dr shawnee fever and if you have not please do go to activehistory.ca i'll link to the original article that prompted this discussion about the bill and sort of the the anti the people who are anti the the celebration of that bill but we also have a lot of other great stuff on the site and do check out some of the past episodes i'm particularly proud of the conversation i had with jim parks the D-Day veteran, which we released earlier this month. So uh, do go and check that out. Subscribe to the show. Do all the likes and sharings and all that stuff that keeps the show going. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll be back with you in a couple weeks. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.